Hi, I'm Keith McCullough and welcome back. We're at the final episode here of this, uh, what's been a great three days, so thanks for Thanks again for your audience. I wanted to have the cleanup hitter, uh, Professor Steve Hankey from Johns Hopkins, who's got as many uh, thought-provoking ideas here for the current situation that we're in as anyone. And hopefully uh, you have a lot of questions on that. As always, just uh, keep those coming in the queue and, and we'll, ask, uh, we'll ask Steve about those as, as we go through it. But, but Steve, thank you. Thank you for making the time. I appreciate it. Great to be with you, Keith. You're, uh, you're in lockdown like me, but it sounds like you're getting it done. And um, I guess you're separated from, from your students and your gen you know, the general pace of life, but you're not unlike a lot of people right now. Um, yeah, you know, you, instead of going into the research lab that I have right next to my office to get my assistance and so forth, I have to use a telephone, so <laughs> that's it. You got to use the old phone again, yeah. Uh, I hear you yeah. on that. Um, well, you, you've been, um, as, as usual, you have some, some great new ideas. A lot of people um, you know, may have not have heard of your, your sledgehammer uh, theory, so maybe we'll start with that, sledgehammer for the, for the COVID-19. Well, the, the, the sledgehammer is, is basically the idea of uh, you know, lo locking down everything and, and turning the economy off. And what we've observed is that, uh, of course, you don't have to be an economist, Keith, to figure out if you if you shut the the factory gate and lock it, that the economy collapses. And and the longer you keep it locked, this is the key. The longer you keep it locked, uh, the more catastrophic the damage will be. So think about the Great Depression, for example. In the Great Depression. Uh, the the factory gates just from one day to the next weren't locked up. It, it, it took time. I mean, there there were there was a banking crisis and there were bank runs and and slowly things started collapsing. Of course, the money supply, the key to the whole thing in the Great Depression, the money supply collapsed. Uh, and when the money supply collapsed, then you had all, all these knock-on effects. But the point is, it, it took a, it took some time. It, it, was, it was somewhat gradual, and the, the death spiral took a while. This lockdown thing is almost instantaneous. There is no death spiral. It's just death. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, gu the guillotine hits you, or the sledgehammer hits you, and that's it. So... This is a, a real problem, uh, and if you look at the the virus, the, the thing from the economic point of view is you, you should try to obviously mitigate the cost of, uh, associated with kind of controlling the virus, and they've been doing that better in places like Singapore and Hong Kong, for example. Uh, those are two good examples. South, South Korea also. Taiwan, Sweden has not uh, used this sledgehammer approach. Even Denmark uh, has, has not used it. They opened schools yesterday in Denmark because they want to keep the economy going a little bit. They, they don't want to lock everything down. They, they want to uh, do a lot of testing, a lot of tracing, uh, quarantine people who are, uh, are a problem. And, and treat them, but don't lock the economy all the way down. Now, one thing you have that I find interesting, Keith, is that the economies that are more free market, that have good high ratings on the economic freedom, they have been the ones with basically lean and mean governments who have acted fast and, and been effective, like Singapore and Hong Kong. I mean, yeah. those are the two freest economies in the world. So right now, everybody's talking about, oh, you've got to have central planning and you've got to have bigger governments, and, and uh, we, we, we didn't have a big enough government. That, that was our problem, supposedly. No, it's just the other way around. It's the lean and mean machines that have gotten the job done, like Singapore and Hong Kong. Anyway, that's, that, that's a sledgehammer. Our, our thing, looking forward from your audience point of view, it's the duration of this lockdown. The lockdown's bad enough anyway, but the longer it lasts, 
uh, the more catastrophic the outcome from the economic point of view will be. Well, I want to I want to go through um, both parts of that because you know people are polarized politically. So to to the extent that anybody says they want it open, they might think that you have a political view there, and if everybody wants it shut down, it might be a political view there. But but what we have here is a failure to communicate. I mean, um, you obviously are a professor of economic history. Uh, and of free market capitalism, so you just loaded that all into a pretty tight bundle there. Um, but what is it about, and, and I'll pop up a table just so that people have uh, the information in front of them, the history of economic recessions and depressions in the USA, it's slide 34, guys. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, this is, this to shut it down and, and, and quite literally have, uh, like you said, death, not a death spiral, only has one rival and it's actually the death spiral. So, <laughs> you know, that, it, I, I don't know how else to explain this to people uh, until they start to wake up to the earnings that are associated with that. Um, but what is it about that that is so damning that has such um, such a workout period is what I what I call it. Uh, a lot of people want a V bottom or whatever they want, but whatever they get, you know, they might be upset about that. What is it about an actual economic depression by which we have very few historical examples that takes so so long to come out of? Well, uh, the, the the big problem with the Great Depression, it, it, we we actually started coming out of it uh, after a couple of years, and and then and then the Fed tight, tightened the screws inadvertently. They thought they were operating a loose monetary policy because they were looking at interest rates, and they they punched interest rates down, but but the money supply itself was actually collapsing. And, and and we had we had another. Uh, I don't. I'm not viewing your charts, but the, the thing sunk then again. So we kind of had a, a double dip, supposedly, yep. and, or, or in reality, in the Great Depression. But it, it was a, it was a monetary policy. So it depends a lot on monetary policy because if you, if you look at the course of an economy. You, you have to have some model, Keith, for national income determination, and the most, uh, the, the best, most reliable model is a monetarist model. And the monetarist model simply says that the, the rate of growth in broad money, properly measured, will determine the rate of growth in nominal GDP. That that contains, a, of course, a real component of GDP and an inflation component of GDP. But if if you look at that, uh, you will see the Great Depression. Uh, we had a collapse in nominal GDP, but before we had a collapse in nominal GDP, what collapsed? <laughs> Broad money. Yep. The money supply. So, so it, 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 it's it, the money supply dominates, but in this particular case. It's a little bit unusual because it, the the money supply dominates because it, it affects aggregate demand, the demand for goods and services. Now this thing we we've hit the supply side, <laughs> so we, we've got kind of a double thing going on. We, we shut the supply side of the economy down. Everybody's talking about supply chains. We took we we tear all the supply chains apart uh, and disrupt those. And, and shut the supply side off. And, and of course, that has a, a ripple effect. That shuts down the demand side of the economy because no one has any money. <laughs> They're not working anymore, mm -hmm. not selling anything anymore. And so, so it's a much more complicated thing than, than the Great Depression in the sense that the Great Depression was primarily a problem with it aggregate demand and, and financial market panic and banking a banking crisis all coming from the monetary side the, the the fed was squeezing and the money supply was going down not up yeah that's um you know big difference obviously but i just want to make sure that people understood you know that that that, that, that is indeed the historical period by which we, we only have one to to go back and, and consider. So this is different like every other economic recession or depression is different and I, I can't encourage people to 
just emblazon that in their mind all of the time as opposed to what a lot of people do, Steve, of course, is they immediately go back to the prior one and, and all the things that happened in the prior one. And they say, well, that's not happening in this one, so we can't be having this one. Um, that's that's bullshit. But um, anyway, <laughs> the, uh, the, the one, the, the one um, uh, country that you mentioned, uh, Sweden, you know, and again, I want to make sure that everybody knows, like what Steve's saying here is a careful reopening. It's not like just, just uh, you know, just run for run for wherever you want to go. Um, what what I haven't studied, I haven't I haven't paid attention enough to Sweden. What's going on there? Well, Sweden has taken the approach. Not, number one, uh, the uh, the sledgehammer is constitutionally actually illegal in Sweden. Uh, one of my close colleagues that I've written a couple books with is Lars Jonig. Who's a, the, actually, it turns out to be. <laughs> One of the experts on the economics of pandemics, but he's he's the big monetary guru in uh, Sweden. He was uh, Prime Minister Carl Bildt's chief advisor uh, back in the 90s, as you remember, when they started unwinding the welfare state. Anyway, Yonig has uh, talked to me about this, and, and it's it's unconstitutional to lock the country down. I mean, the government really has it doesn't have the constitutional authority to do that because freedom of movement is enshrined in the constitution in Sweden. So that's that's one point. That's a legal point. But but as a policy point, they they also had the idea originally that they they didn't want to shut the economy down. They wanted to keep things going as as much as they could in a prudent way and and again test isolate people who and quarantine them if they had the virus or, or if they'd been in contact with other people who had the virus so so that has been their modus operandi they've tried to keep things going and 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 keep people social distancing and all all these other things that, that we all are experiencing but keep keep the keep the engine going. Now the the big problem they really have is that about fifty percent of their GDP is connected with foreign trade. So this right. gets into the aggregate demand side of the thing. <laughs> if everyone else is using a sledgehammer, not everything is locked up, and and uh, about half of your GDP is all connected with foreign trade, uh, you you have a problem because you have wh where are you going to sell things? Mm -hmm. So, so things have slowed down there and so forth, but but they they have they have proceeded in a shall we say less costly way than most other countries have. They they have more flexibility, and uh, you know the the schools are open, and not the universities, but the the, the primary schools. Yeah. Are, yeah. Right. Well, that I mean that that at least alleviates some of the. Uh the stress in the home. I mean, there's a lot of that developing in the USA as well. There's some, some terrible stories, obviously, of, uh, uh, of that, and I don't want to get into that, actually. Um, but on the, on, the, on the policy side, like just on the QE side, and, and, and I think you know, your view is that this isn't going to trigger some German-type hyperinflation, but, but what is it so far? And I know that you're not like uh, the Fed fanboy out there, but I mean, like, what is it so far about this that's happened so, well, so quickly? Well, uh, uh, on the 10th of March, uh, John Greenwood, who's a chief economist at Invesco, and I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal, uh, and, and we essentially said cent the central bank is to operate as a lender of last resort to avoid a financial panic. And, and what that means is that the, the Fed uh, should, in, in short, dis discount uh, any kind of paper that, that has good collateral behind it and supply liquidity to the market. And and so uh, on the 12th, two days after that article, uh, the Fed uh, opened the floodgates and did exactly what uh, Greenwood and I uh, thought and recommended that they should do. And as a result, from uh, actually from March until April 8th, if you look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, 
it's gone from about 4.2 trillion to 6.1 trillion. That's a 43 percent increase. It, it, it's the biggest explosion in the size of the balance sheet on record. And and the biggest chunk of that increase has been the Fed buying treasuries. Uh, they've also bought mortgage-backed securities. Uh, repos have been about flat. And one thing that, that Greenwood and I recommended that they introduce are swap lines uh, with other central banks because the world operates on, on a dollar standard. Everything is priced and invoiced in dollars. Everybody needs dollars, but a lot of the particularly the Asian central banks where these critical supply chains are, are concentrated uh, in, in, the, in the world international economy, they have access to dollars, but not enough. So they need swap lines. And this, the swap line has is, is, uh, is been introduced uh, to five new central banks in that period, and, and, a, and a huge explosion of uh, of swaps. Uh, we've we've had an increase of they were about zero at the start of the period, and they've gone up uh, by about three hundred and fifty eight billion over that period from March fourth to April eighth. So, so the the Fed's doing exactly what they should be doing, in in my view, and and they and they have stopped a, a financial panic. We we have not gone into financial panic. But of course, the, the thing is that the money supply uh, is dramatically increased because not only is the Fed, the Fed produces state money. That's about 10 percent of the broad money that's produced in the economy. Remember I said when I started, you had to have a model or idea uh, about national income determination and the monetarist model, which is the most accurate one, says that growth in broad money properly measured will determine the growth rate and nominal GDP going forward. So broad money uh, is mainly made up of bank money produced by commercial banks. About, about 90 percent of broad money is produced by commercial banks, and we've had a huge dash for cash and bank deposits have exploded, and, and, and bank money produced by commercial banks has is, is, is gone up at an unprecedented rate. So the problem, Keith, if this continues with the, with the Fed increasing state money and the bank uh, money increasing uh, and this goes into, let's say, September or something like that, we could easily see broad money growing at may maybe 20% or something like that. Right, right now, it's been growing at around 7 or 8% before this crisis. And if real growth is 2 to 3%, the trend rate, you can see there's a, <laughs> there's a big gap in there <laughs> between 3% 3, 3 and 20%. If the, if the money supply is growing at, at broadly measured at 20%, and, and real growth, let's say the trend rate or potential is around 3%, that implies that the inflation would be maybe 17% or something like that. So that's a potential problem. Uh, <laughs> the Fed does what it's supposed to do. The banks are doing what they're supposed to do. Every, everything is fine temporarily, but you can't continue on that kind of pace for a long period of time. Otherwise, you start generating quite a bit more inflation. Yeah, I mean, that's that's just uh, the f that fact of the matter is uh, we're not there yet. And, 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 and it's interesting that you use that timeline, though, because, you know, if oil goes to 10, you know, by the time we get down the road, and I always talk uh, talk about this, I mean, there's a time and space you know, that you need to solve for here. It's not just, you know, the actual act of money printing, but the time and space of economic recovery. If you're in recovery and you maintain that pace of printing, you absolutely, from very deflated points, can have uh, extreme reflation at a, at a bare minimum. Is how I'd define it. I, I, do you agree with that? Yes, you, you would. So they'll, the, the, they'll eventually part of the, the shall we say, the healing process. They they've done the right thing now. The the Fed has put a tourniquet on. on things in, in, a, in a way, actually, yep. it's, it's kind of a reverse, but, but, but at any rate, they've done the right thing, but, 
but now they're 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 faced with a problem of 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 unwinding what they wound up. That that will be their next problem. Oh, I mean, yeah. they're they're. I, well, some people think that they're never gonna they're never gonna do that, and and actually, you know, this is day three of this um, investing summit, and I've had like the gamut here, Steve, uh, in terms of how people think about this. But uh, one is the Pandora's box, and I wonder if you agree with this characterization of it or not, of MMT 1.0, or just the merging of the Federal Reserve with the U.S. Treasury. That we're already there. Well, not 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 really. I, I see. To uh, the, your question, kind of gets into uh, we 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 have to go back to the crisis in, in two thousand and eight and and the and the Great Recession. Now, a lot of the a lot of people were very excited because we we also had a, 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 a first of all to explain what was going on there, because most people st still don't get it. You have to separate broad money into its two components, state money produced by the Fed and broad money produced by the commercial banks. So when we started uh, the Great Recession in 2008, again, the state money made up about 10 percent of the total. and. Uh, bank money made up the remaining 90 percent. But remember, at that point in time, of course, the economy was much more leveraged. The starting point was different than the starting point now. But banks and bankers were deemed to be the villains. And we had we had at the same time as Dodd Frank regulations and the, all all the new banking regulations came in, put the squeeze on banks, and at the same time you had something called Basel III, which is the capital requirements coming out of, of Basel. They came in and hit hit at about the same time, and so you actually had bank money contracting. Yeah. In other words. <laughs> And we're starting a recession, and, and banks are, are getting squeezed to death, and, and the, and the uh, absolute value of their uh, money being produced by them actually went down. Mm -hmm. So then what did the Fed do? Then, then the Fed actually did the right thing to mitigate that problem that was imposed by the government going into a pro-cyclical squeeze on commercial banks. The Fed said, we're going to have a Great Depression unless we have quantitative easing. And, and they were right. We would have had a Great Depression. We had a Great Recession because the quantitative easing did mitigate the drop in bank money produced by commercial banks, but it, but it didn't. It, it, it just mitigated. It, it, it didn't overcome that drop. And as a result, for 10 years, we had very slow monetary growth and very tight money in the United States until really last year. Last year, things started becoming a little bit normal again. But the broad money was growing very slowly throughout all this period because bank regulations, in effect, made monetary policy very tight, even though we had quantitative easing. If you add quantitative easing up and, and the state money to the bank money side, the overall picture is one of tight money. And most people just don't get this. Everyone was screaming that we were going to have hyperinflation because the Fed was exploding their balance sheet and we were in quantitative easing and so forth. We never had it because the broad money never really grew very fast in this whole period of time. Yeah, and, and, and then you had a, a call, uh, effectively, uh, in the collateral window, you had a call on bank money uh, by everyone in the world who didn't want anybody else's money. I mean, that was, uh, and that was the QE before the current QE, and I think a, 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 the, even the Fed really, Steve, wouldn't care. W for some reason, they didn't want to characterize that, not to go down the rabbit hole on, on what they were doing in the repo market, but why, why, why is it that they didn't want to just outright accept or acknowledge um, that they were expanding the Fed's balance sheet to try to solve for that liquidity problem. Well, I, I think I think they did acknowledge that 
that they were in, in, in I mean we knew they were engaged in QE and yeah. and 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 they, and they didn't the, the only thing they didn't really explain and this this gets into a remark actually you made earlier Keith communication is is the key in any of these crises time is your you got four components in a crisis time is your enemy you've got to act and do things rapidly and uh, second thing you've got to You've got to do big things. You've got to lead boldly, and and three, you've you've got to communicate clearly uh, because that affects public opinion and people's uh, degree of confidence and so forth. And you've got to implement things very rapidly. Now, the the big problem we have now is three: the communications is is very muddled. It's it's very confused as to what's what's actually going on from day to day. <laughs> I'd say, and, yeah. and this comes. This, this this comes from every angle you can think of. The White House is not clear. The 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 con- Congress is Congress is actually somewhat more clear than the, than the White House. And then you've got the governors all, all yakking in different directions. So you, you've got the whole thing very politicized. You you hit on this earlier, and and that is a real problem because it's the communications. The communications issue is an issue, and and of course part of that is that we, we will have a, a national election in, in November. So as we move into that, that's that's always a danger zone when you talk about communications. So so I think communications are uh, a, a, a big problem, and and a, and a lot of a lot of what you read. For example, in the Great Recession, uh, Andrew Lowe, uh, professor at MIT, uh, excellent uh, professor, did a, a review article in the Journal of Economic Literature in 2012, and he reviewed 21 books that had been written uh, about the Great Recession, and and not one of those, there wasn't a single reference to money or broad money <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and m sub zero m sub one m sub two m sub three you name it there is not one and 21 21 books he reviewed now that shows you the problem we have because i i started <laughs> out by telling you that it, it's money stupid money dominates money money will be a critical factor and it was in the Great Recession because the money supply never grew, <laughs> contrary to what what all the all the gold bugs, all the doomsters were saying. We were going to have hyperinflation because of quantitative easing and so forth. It never happened, and it never happened because quantitative easing was a small portion of the broad money supply. The elephant in the room is always banks, yep. bank money. Well, it's the money, stupid. I love that. I mean, it's it's it's, and and I think this is what people love about you, Steve. You just like you speak like a, a normal human being, and 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 obviously you have um, everything academically backstopping it. But you know, people need to be communicated to like with real words. I mean, it is the money, stupid. It is the cycle, stupid. It is. I often say it's the gravity. Like I might might as well call you know it's the gravity, stupid. Um, but on that third point, and we're going to get some questions by the way uh, next. Uh, pop your questions in the in the queue, please. Like, I love that, how you, you have the, the four different points. You have, you have time, leadership, communication, and um, implementation. On the communication piece, what part of this, and, and, and people, again, if you're not communicating, then you're now subject to people's, uh, people's opinion on what, what it is or what the hell it is you're doing with the money, stupid. Um, and people are quite concerned about the reality of that. Like, the, what we do know is that, that money is going to certain places that, uh, it wasn't you know, specifically intended to, and it's being communicated that it is going to everyone who runs a dry cleaner or a small restaurant or everything else. What about what about that? Do you do you, do you have any uh, thoughts well, or concerns you, about that? Yeah, yeah. You, you you have to separate the the, the fiscal program uh, that, that's uh, been put in place. That that's a two point two trillion dollars now, and 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 counting, and the, There'll be more installments. They've already said they've run out of money for small businesses, so there'll be some more going in that. That comes from the fiscal side, and that and that's Congress. And uh, 
and 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 if and, and that imply and and then and then you've got the the monetary side and that's the the Fed and and the Fed opening the the, the spigots for the lender of last resort. So you, you have to think about these two things in a, in a separate way. Now the fiscal side, there's a lot of money flowing out. And, and there will be, by, by definition, the, the big problem is uh, associated with that. <laughs> we're we're going to have a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, it, it just goes without saying. If you're if you're putting that much fiscal money out in a fairly short period of time, you're going to have a, a tremendous amount of waste, fraud, and abuse. And so that's that's one problem. Yep. The other problem is is the fourth point that I raised about implementing things rapidly. And the question is, if you, if you keep the economy locked down, as we have it now, with a sledgehammer, uh, it's questionable whether they can actually deliver a lot of those fiscal dollars fast enough to save people from, from uh, sure death or suicide. So, so that's that's the fiscal side. Now, let me let me talk about that for just a minute because uh, this implies, by the way, that you'll have a, a, a huge fiscal deficit if you're spending that much more money. Yeah, of course. So there 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 are ways to there are only three ways to deal with the uh, impending fiscal deficit. One thing is that you can finance it with taxation. And, and that uh, will not affect inflation, by the way, because you're transferring spending from the private sector to the public sector. So, so that is one aspect. That, that will probably come later, but initially it's, it's not going to come. Uh, so that means uh, if you'll, you'll have a deficit and, and so you can borrow, that's, that's another mechanism. If you borrow from from the non-bank public, from businesses and, and households, uh, that won't affect uh, uh, in, inflation either, because uh, it, it, it will simply be taking. It, 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 it will obviously squeeze the capital markets, uh, but, but that's about, that's about it. Uh, the, the second way of borrowing is if you borrow from banks. Now, if, if you borrow from banks, that does create money, and and that means the money supply, and that means potentially inflation. The third way is you can run the printing press, uh, and there are really three ways to do that. Uh, you, you can um, actually buy bonds directly uh we we don't do that in the united states they they do that in zimbabwe and venezuela where where the government spends money and they're running a big deficit and and they can't tax and and they can't borrow on the private sector so they just go to the central bank and point a gun at the governor's head and say you know <laughs> we got some paper here it's, it looks great <laughs> <laughs> uh, buy it, buy it, and 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 they literally buy it direct and print money. There, there are two other ways that that actually um, do create money by running the printing press, and that is uh, commercial banks purchasing government bonds that that would, uh, and they could also keep interest rates artificially low. And and have also an undervalued currency, and and that would create money. So you you have some some ways to finance the deficit that that don't uh, are, that aren't inflationary. One is just tax, just finance it with taxing. Uh, the other is if you borrow from the the non-bank public sector. But there, all the other mechanisms potentially create. Um, uh, Inflation because they're creating uh, more money. So you, you've got to look at, at, at what goes on because spending this fiscal side doesn't necessarily imply that you're going to have more inflation. It might, it might, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will. And that and that's our problem: analyzing the thing, what what, what they're doing. In other words, you've got to kind of lay out the roadmap of the possibilities, Keith. 
and and then be able to analyze the thing going forward. So it, it starts getting complicated right away, as you as you can see, especially because we're talking about very large amounts of money. Well, you're talking about very large amounts of money and and very large standard error on when the quote unquote demand comes back, which is kind of full circle on this discussion on why you're focused on you know sledgehammer versus. Uh, reopening and and just getting on with it. I mean, that's that's you know, solving for time is the hardest part. I mean, if you can't get that, I mean, you can come up with a lot of theories, I suppose, but um, that's that's a tough one, and that's why you know. Yeah. I mean, well, that, that, that you put your finger on exactly the point. This is this is precisely the problem. It, it, you, if you if you lock everything up for a month. People can kind of get some handle on, on what's going to happen if, if things all open up in month two. But but if the thing drags on and, and it's locked up for two months, three months, it, it just gets beyond the capacity of people to eat, to literally even think about it. Oh, they that, get that's, that's and, the and, problem. And they get you know then then the whole behavioral uh, finance component to this comes into play. Uh, we have a lot of questions on that too. Like, are people, are young people scared to, uh, scared of the future? Are they, do they don't have a job now? It's the first generation, uh, first time millennials as a generation rather has been fired. Does that reduce fertility? Um, you know, in in the U.S., there's a lot. I mean, there's so many different things. I mean, that's why this is you know, like the great example of of nonlinearity, uh, I suppose. But um, I digress a bit on that. I just want to make sure I get a couple questions in here from the queue, uh, Steve, before um, before our time's up. Uh, one is a you know, interesting question. You know, in the aftermath of all this, Steve, do you think that uh, geopolitical tensions will most likely increase or not? Well, I I think the the answer to that is yes. And 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 what we have one thing we haven't talked about, Keith, is that. With, with every crisis, you, the, the power of the state is massively increased. Every, every crisis, you, you have what is called the ratchet effect, and, and you ratchet up the government regulations, government spending, government programs. Basically, the tyranny of the government will, will become a much, much greater, especially after this crisis, because this is a real doozy. But every single crisis, that is the problem. And and, you, you, and, and and what's ironic about it is that many of the crises are actually caused by the government in the first place. And, and then there's a, a call by all of the public and the politicians to even have more government. So, and, and in many cases, a crisis starts and then the government does the wrong thing, like the Great Recession in 2008. The Great Recession was a complete government fiasco because once it started, the bank regulations came in. They they put a credit squeeze in the in the in bank money, which made up ninety percent of of the total broad money supply, which which was pro cyclical. It's not counter cyclical. The government screwed the thing up, and we, and we went pro cyclical. That, that's why the Great Recession lasted so long. We had so many new regulations and everything laid into the thing, uh, and, and, and the effect on the money supply was, was quite negative and damaging. So, so that, uh, that, that is what really bothers me. It, more than coming out of the thing in the short run, which, which is very uh, problematic and uh, in anyone's guess, the long-run damage, I think, will be phenomenal because we will have many more government programs, a much bigger government uh, than, than we even dreamed of before the coronavirus hit. So, so the thing will be very politicized, and, and we, we are going to enter, I think, an age of, of super big government on steroids. Well, yeah, I mean, you have bipartisan support. I mean, there's no such thing as a party that is fiscally conservative. I mean, it's not, you know, Trump's going to love a lot of the ideas uh, from Stephanie Kelton, for example. Uh, I don't want to go down down that path quite yet. I just want to make sure I get a couple more of these questions. Um, uh, this one in particular, you know, given uh, your comments on money supply growth 
uh, and, and supply chain, Steve, do you, do you expect this will, um, in the, we'll see some endemic shortages of goods later in the year? Yeah, yes, um, I, I do, because the, the supply chains have, have really been so disrupted. And, and again, it, it, the, the answer to the question depends a, a little bit on um, uh, how long the, the lockdown lasts. The, right. the longer it lasts, the greater the disruptions, the greater the uh, oddball shortages of all kinds. Uh, uh, so that's that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I mean, our industrials. Um, my partner here runs our industrials research business. I mean, he always reminds me. He goes, you know, Keith, you know, when they when they shut a factory, you don't just turn it back on. I mean, that's it. so so the longer you go in time, and the more business owners that decide to shutter, uh, the more likely the the workout period is longer. That's that's just the way that it is, and I don't know why. You know, people don't understand that. That that to me, like when you say it's the money stupid, it's it's the capacity stupid. You can't just turn that on and rehire a bunch of people. And by the way, the people go to other places, right? They're not they're not just going to sit there and starve. They're going to find a place to right. work and, and and find a way to feed their family. So that's actually going on too. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Just the mobility of labor, actually. Um, don't forget, a lot of these people weren't being paid for very well to begin with. Yeah, the mo mobility is a problem, uh, and and you mentioned startup, and and a, and a, a lot of what we have had in the past, these small businesses, they're, they'll go to the wall. So the, so they it, it, there, there's not there's no switch to turn on. I mean, <laughs> they're out, they're out, they're yeah. gone. And so so you you will have, of course, eventually startups. Coming in and, and and filling in that space, but how long is this going to all take? To start a business is is not that easy. Who's going to start it? Who's going to finance it? Who's going to have the idea to run the thing? Who's going to have the knowledge to know how to? It, it, it's it, it's just a, a mind-boggling exercise trying to think through what the economics are because. Uh, by the, by the way, economists really aren't trained to do this kind of thing. No, it's 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 and, and humans aren't either. I mean, that's uh, humans. Uh, I, I'm more concerned about the humans. I'm definitely not concerned about. No offense to you and I, but we're, I'm not concerned about the economists. I mean, this is um, you know. I have this uh, slide. I'll pop up here, but I'm sure you're well aware of the data. Slide 79, guys, on um, small businesses having no cushion and what what their actual rope is here, Steve, in terms of time. I mean, basically, 55% of small businesses are kaput. You know, put, w once you enter the three-plus-month period, and, and that's a that's a huge number in terms of the actual employed base of, of America. And 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 again, like you said, you know, if you can't survive and you shut it down, you don't just start it up again with un unless the money comes from in your mailbox from Mnuchin. I guess he's probably working on that. Um, but that's 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 the economy we well, yeah. we have. <laughs> Yeah, that particular pile of money, I think they're out of already. Yeah, I think that 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 that, that just flashed across the screen this morning. So, but, but if you the, the the big thing is that these small businesses are are important because they they are in fact the big job machine in the United States. Exactly. That's that's yeah. that, that's, who, that's who creates uh, jobs. It's, it's these small and medium sized businesses. So if you if you put them on the sideline and, and they're slow to and, and some of them just don't make it and, and and have to be replaced by something brand new, some startup. All, all of this takes time, and we we just don't know what the course will be. It's very hard to predict. Well, what we do know is that you know we get these you know like you said the communication part is key, and um, you know Cuomo uh, today I think he pushed to May fifteenth. In, uh, in my state, in Connecticut, we'd already had the push, schools closed, basically, you know, towns closed till, uh, till May 20th. So we knew where those, where those, where those timelines were probably going, um, but that doesn't quite fit with what I think we're, I'm coming to conclude at least, and, and tell me if I'm, I have the wrong takeaway here, but um, my conclusion of your analysis here is, you got to open this sucker up at least. Let you know, re, you know, loosen some of the restrictions and redefine it. Maybe the way that Sweden has or other ideas, and not be so beholden to 
lock it down. You know, um, am I right on that? Right. Okay. Right. That, that's a, that's the a direction we're going to have to move in. Uh, the, the, uh, even the the Germans now are getting on this thing, but but to do this safely is critical, and 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 that means that we're going to have to ramp up testing uh, yeah. in a massive massive amount. Our, our testing is 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 very low compared to some place like Germany, Hong Kong. Singapore, all, all of these are they're testing much more than the United States, and then you, and then you've got this tracing problem, and 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 that is is going to be a tricky one because there are privacy issues associated with it. Uh, you mean like so, um, like like biometrics, like you have to put your finger on something before you walk into the school or into the well, restaurant? I, uh, well, it's, no, no, it's it, it, it's it's in it's in our iPhones. They, they they want they want they they want to they want to be able to track you, yeah. and and identify who who you've been in contact with. That's part of the testing. You you test, and 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 okay, a test. You either have it or don't have it. Then then the tracing part is, okay. Let's say you have it. Then the, then the next question is, well, where have you been? Who have you seen? Exactly. Who have you been in contact yeah. with? That's the tracing part. And, and that, they can do that with uh, the, the information contained in an iPhone. Right. But there are, pri there are a lot of privacy issues. Usually, if you do that, you, you've, you've got to go to, if, if the authorities want to get at that, the, uh, let's say the FBI or somebody, some you know, police department, they, they've got to go to a court and get a court order for it. So what are you going to do with the whole population? So <laughs> so that's a whole set of things. And another thing, as you would say, Keith, we don't need to get out in the weeds on that. But but it is a complication. It, it, it's something that will have to be addressed. Well, it's, it's a societal thing. It's a cultural thing. I mean, in Singapore, to your point, I mean, uh, they they publish you know stuff like that on 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 the national website daily. You know, it's not like um, you know Keith McCullough has it and his dog Boomer is tracking because you can see him running around the yard because that's the only you know the the only you know uh, animal he's been close to uh, as of late. So that's his point of contact. But that's the kind of information and transparency on mobility that you're talking about, right? I mean, that's that's a Confucian society. Right. That's right. not that's not America. Um, there's a, there, it's, it's hard for me to believe that, 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 that America would go for that. Um, I guess I should have an open mind to anything. Well, it, uh, we are talking about a pandemic. I mean, the telephone companies have all this information anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it it, 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 it's a whole other program where you'd have to have a, an expert uh, uh, on on this issue, not not an economist <laughs> <laughs> talking to you. Yes, but but I, I, I can point out the, the the issue. The issue is the one that I've identified with the with the tracing. You have to you do have to figure out some some way to effectively trace as well as test uh, if if you want to max the opening up. Uh, in a safe way, because yeah. uh, obviously, obviously people pe pe people don't want to o open up in an unsafe way, and and and, and you know have a, you know all, all the problems associated with just a, a wide open thing. No, you've got to do it carefully in a in some kind of planned way. But I think we're moving in that direction, even globally. Uh, the, the the sledgehammer it is is clear. It's been imposed, but the the costs are fantastic. People are starting to recognize that. Starting to recognize the longer you have it on, the, the more more catastrophic things will be. And, and people, you have to think about people and public opinion. People are are getting annoyed with a sledgehammer. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they, you know, being in, at, at home for a couple of weeks and uh, restricted and so forth and, and, and not work, may, mainly not working. Yeah. Uh, all, all of a sudden, people start thinking, this, this, this can't go on, you know, I'm going to die. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to die, not from the virus. I'm going to die because I'm going to be starving. Yeah, it's, it's brutal. Uh, and I guess that's maybe... Uh 
one way to, to end the conversation, even though we didn't come up with uh, anything tangible that's going to happen tomorrow. At least people have a, a different framework, Steve, to, uh, as you always have. I mean, you've, you've, you've always been that independent thinker who's not part of officialdom, and, um, and, and I, uh, I, I certainly appreciate you walking through your thoughts and taking the time to put it in a framework so people could understand it. Uh, I think you did that today. So thanks, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Keith. Good to be with you on Head Try. All right. Stay safe, Steve. And, and to those of you as well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, by the way. This is uh, the end of it. Three days is not, not a marathon for me, as I said. For me, it's much more, it's not really work. I don't feel like what I've ever done is work. It's, it's, it's for me, it's learning. It's constantly re-educating myself. It's evolving. Uh, and again, that's what I do for me, and hopefully uh, that, that happened for you too in the last three days. Thanks a ton for being our audience.